Mark chapter 5. We're a little late getting into things here, so for sake of time, we've got a passage of 20 verses. I'm not going to read all those here at the beginning. We'll try to walk through those to save some time, though, this morning. Uh, But this is uh, our series on more than a name. Uh, We're going to look at people in Scripture who were never told what their name is. And this morning, this is another one of those individuals. But as you read through the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ, this is recorded in Matthew, Luke, and Mark. This is one of the most powerful events in the ministry of Jesus, one that demonstrates the power that he has over Satan, over the demons, uh, his deity. It represents the power that he has to change our lives. Uh, We're talking about uh, this morning a shameless, nameless maniac, the maniac of Gadara. Uh, There's been several sermons uh, preached with the title uh, on this passage that always makes me laugh. Uh, I was looking last night to see if I could find who originally preached it with this title, and I didn't find it, uh, but I've, I saw several different preachers who used the same title for this one. Uh, when they preached this passage, they call it uh, a nude dude in a rude mood. Uh, as we have, a, we have a guy who's going to be running around naked. Uh, he's angry. Uh, he's demon-possessed, uh, and he's in a bad mood when Jesus and his disciples show up. But when Jesus shows up, things change. Uh, All throughout the life and ministry of Jesus, wherever Jesus went, things happened. Uh, And it reminds us today that we have a man here without hope. Many times in our lives, we feel like we're without hope. We see people that we think, oh, there's no hope for them. But when Jesus shows up, there's hope. Amen? And so uh, we think of the verse in Hebrews chapter 7 that says, He's able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him. Uh, don't give up hope for those people in your life that you're praying for. People that you think, man, I, I've tried to witness to them. I've, I've tried to share the gospel with them. There's just no hope for these people. Don't give up on them. Uh, God specializes in turning impossible situations around. Uh, with God, all things are possible. And so that's what we see here in Mark chapter uh, 5. And we know that Satan, uh, he has... He comes, well, in the book of John it says that he's a thief and he's come to kill, uh, destroy, to steal, to ruin, uh, to turn things upside down. He wants to take whatever God has made good uh, and he wants to destroy that. And that's what he does in our lives. We were made in the image of God. Uh, We were made good when God created us. Uh, What happened, though? Mankind sinned. The fall happened. And ever since then, Satan's been distorting what God created to be perfect and to be good through sin. And this passage this morning in Mark chapter 5, it's going to show how sin affects every single aspect of a person's life until they're just completely out of control. Uh, And this man, more than maybe anybody in Scripture, proves the destructive uh, nature of sin and the destructive nature of Satan with this unnamed demon-possessed man. But... Praise the Lord, Uh, we think of the devil, we think of Satan, we think of the demons, uh, and one thing we know is that God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. Satan is not. Uh, Satan's not all-powerful. Scripture tells us in the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 62, it says, God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, power belongeth unto God. Satan uh, walks around as the, the ruler of darkness here on earth. Uh, he thinks that he's powerful, but we know that, in, especially through this passage, he's going to meet his match when he comes toe-to-toe with the Lord. And we know as we've gone through this prophecy series on Sunday mornings during the main service, we see that, yeah, the devil thinks he's got a lot of power right now. He may control things right now down here, but there's going to come a day that once again the Lord's going to reveal that he is all-powerful. Satan is not. Uh, the devil will try to go toe-to-toe with the Lord once more. Uh, We're here in the Easter season. Again, Satan thought, you know, uh, Jesus has died. He's in the grave. Uh, We've defeated him. Uh, But once again, Jesus proved that he is all-powerful as he rose from the grave. Uh, Satan doesn't have the power. Uh, The Lord does. Jeremiah 32, 17, it says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by the great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. And nothing's too hard for God to do. No situation is too hopeless for the Lord to walk into. Nothing in your life is too big for God to walk into and to turn that situation around. And so Satan's on a mission to destroy lives. He was trying to destroy this man's life 
in Mark chapter 5. Uh, but that's the opposite of what Jesus' mission on earth was. What did he tell us? He said, uh, I'm come to seek and to save the lost. He was here uh, to find the one lost sheep who went astray. He was the good shepherd uh, looking for those wandering off. He said, I am come in John chapter 10, verse 10. Right after he says the thieves come uh, not but for, to steal and to kill and destroy. But he says, I'm come. My mission, the reason that I'm here on earth is that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. That's the opposite of what Satan wants in our lives, isn't it? And praise the Lord for this verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Many times we use this. Uh, Paul said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Uh, the Lord delights in turning things around and changing hopeless situations. So first this morning, we see Satan's presence uh, in this incident. We see a demonic presence uh, in this uh, passage in Mark chapter 5. He was doing uh, exactly what he's been doing since the day that he rebelled against God in heaven. The day that he said, uh, I will be like the Most High. Uh, I'll sit on the throne. And so from that day when Satan and a third of the angels were cast out and became uh, demons, uh, they make up the principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness. I mentioned Ephesians chapter 6, spiritual warfare. Uh, that's what we're talking about. Satan uh, has free reign on earth right now to kind of do as he pleases. And the Bible says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, so we're talking this morning about a demon-possessed man, something that people couldn't see uh, these demons with their physical eyes, but this was real. And they were working to ruin this man's life, and they worked to ruin the lives of those who will uh, yield to them. And so the effect of work is uh, of their work is at uh, hand here in Mark chapter 2, verse number 3. It says, when Jesus, uh, when he was come out of the ship, they had just finished passing over uh, the Sea of Galilee. He had just calmed the storm on the sea. Jesus had just demonstrated his power over nature. And then he says, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. This guy has a very morbid residence. Uh, he's living among the tombs, uh, among the bodies of those who have died. Uh, it seems kind of unusual. Why would somebody want to live among the dead? But it sort of mirrors the Bible description uh, of us as believers before we became Christians, before we were saved. The Bible says we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were kind of like this uh, demon-possessed man. We were living among the dead. Uh, we were one of the dead. Uh, but then we met Jesus, and he quickened us. He makes us alive. Uh, we no longer dwell in that morbid place among the dead. We're alive. And so this man, uh, here he is living among the tombs with this unclean spirit, this demon-possessed man. Uh, you know, a lot of times people today, they try to hide behind, uh, you know, fancy clothes. They'll try to hide behind beautiful houses, uh, cars, gadgets. But uh, inside, uh, the picture can be very different. A lot of times people today are just like this man was. They may not be physically living among the dead and among the tombs, but many times we can be just like this man. Uh, the book of Isaiah says, uh, from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been clothed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Uh, that's a picture of people before they come to Jesus Christ, like this man. Uh, you may not be doing some of the things that this man was, but there's no doubt that when sin, when the devil has reign in our lives, that's a picture of what he does. And, of course, not all demonization is, you know, as blatantly gross as what we see here in Mark chapter 5. There are demon-possessed people uh, that don't look anything like this man, but there's, uh, there's no doubt there's demon possession that takes place in our world today, that takes place in the United States of America today. Right. Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians uh, that Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. Sometimes things will look good on the outside, but inside uh, is just what the book of Isaiah said. Uh, so it's no surprise that 
if his servants also disguise themselves as angels of light when they are rulers of darkness. It makes me think sort of a, a little bit like the, uh, the little girl. Sometimes, you know, we, in our, even in our own lives, if, if we're saved, uh, and I'll say this, that uh, saved individuals, you cannot be demon-possessed. There's people who think, you know, well, I can get possessed by a demon. If you're a believer, uh, you cannot be demon-possessed. Uh, you can be oppressed by uh, wickedness and uh, dark forces, but you cannot be demon-possessed. But I heard the story of the little girl. You know, sometimes we want to say, you know, well, the devil made me do something. I heard the story of the little girl. She was in a fight with her brother, and her mom came in, and she's on top of her brother and pulling his hair and hitting him. I don't know. Was that you and me? Is this story about you? You've been doing that? She comes in. Her mom pulls her off of her brother. And she says to her, she says, you know, why did you let the devil put it into your heart to pull your brother's hair to kick him in the shins? And she sat there for a minute, she thought, and she said, well, maybe the devil put it in my head to pull my brother's hair, but kicking his shins was my own idea. You know, we're very capable on our own, even without, uh, you know, the the devil doesn't always make us do things. Uh, Sometimes we're very capable of being wicked uh, on our own. Uh, One a theologian, he once said, uh, I don't necessarily know what a person, what a bad individual's heart looks like, but I know what the heart of a good individual looks like, and it's desperately wicked. Yes. As the Bible says, our hearts are desperately wicked. Even good people have bad hearts. We don't sometimes have to have the devil help us to do bad things. We're good enough of that on our own. This man, though, was clearly demon-possessed. He's got a morbid residence, and he's working hard to try to hide his condition. And and Satan, at the same time, is working hard to make him look like this man is invincible. Verse number 3, it says, No man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And so we see a mocking rebellion in this man's life. Um... Satan's influence through sin, a lot of times, it makes the flesh feel like it's invincible. Like it's powerful. Uh, Many times, you know, lost people, they will laugh about their sinful lifestyle. They'll mock at God and his word, uh, sort of like uh, this demon-possessed man. They feel like they're above needing a crutch of Christianity. Uh, But the book of Proverbs tells us that fools make a mock of sin. Fools make a mock of sin. And then notice the the monstrous rage that this man has. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. As I was reading about this, it talks about uh, how this man would just let out screams from this demon possession that he had. You know, in life, uh, the Lord allows us to have free will. We're free to make our own choices. You can make your own choices in life. What you can't choose, though, are the consequences of those choices. You're not free to choose the consequences of it. Um, And while this man may have mocked, he may have laughed at the idea of God at some point in his life, uh, he had no idea the misery that sin and Satan and his forces would bring him under. Now, that's what Satan does to us. You know, a lot of times sin advertises itself in the beginning as fun and as exciting. Uh, uh, An ad for a popular vodka uh, says that it is absolute magic. Another alcohol says this is where paradise is found. Another alcohol company uses this line, fairy tales can come true. And they use the the myth that alcohol is where you find pleasure. That's where you find excitement. That's where you find fun. Uh, That somehow, you know, alcohol is this magic carpet that's going to carry you away to very exciting adventures. Sin's always exciting in the beginning. It's always enticing at the start. If you drink alcohol, you know, you're going to be the most interesting man in the world, as one alcohol company advertises. 
you know, you'll be successful, you can be sophisticated. It really advertises a great picture. And if you don't drink alcohol, you know, your life, you're probably going to be dull and ordinary and mediocre. Now, this morning, uh, I praise the Lord for this. Uh, I've never tasted alcohol. I don't know what it tastes like. And I, I praise the Lord for that. I'm glad that I grew up in a home uh, where I was taught from a very young age that alcohol is something to stay away from. So I don't know what it's like to drink alcohol. And I, I thank the Lord for that. Uh, I praise the Lord for that testimony. Uh, I, we hope that we can raise our son with the same kind of testimony, that he grows up never knowing what alcohol tastes like. But those of you in the room this morning, I've heard my dad talk about it enough. What he was like before he got saved, the drunk that he was before he got saved, and how God changed his life, and how God uh, took that away from him. And I've heard the stories, and I've heard some of you share the stories. Would you say this morning that, that the ads that we see for alcohol, uh, is it true? No. Uh, that, that's not the endings that we see Instead, we see things like happened this week in Pensacola where a man under the influence of a substance kills someone. That's the face of alcohol. That's what it does. You can look at the victims of abuse, broken homes. That's what alcohol does. And we heard the sermon the other, the other night at church on, on why I hate the devil. You could preach a sermon on alcohol, uh, why I hate the devil, because of that alone. Alcohol's not really uh, the one that says, you know, it's, it's about fairy tales coming true. Uh, alcohol's more of like a horror movie, isn't it? Alcohol, it's related to parties. It's related to good times, celebrations, fun. But it never shows us the suicide, the murder. My wife's mother, Megan's mother, She's no longer on this earth because a man under the influence of alcohol took her life. That's the face of alcohol. Those connections are never made in ads, though, are they? Sin seems fun in the beginning. But what does the book of Hebrews tell us? It says, you know, you can enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. For a season, a short time. Uh, we think of the seasons, man, uh, it just seems like we came out of Christmas, doesn't it? And here we are in spring. And before long, we'll be hitting summer, and you'll have summer break. Kids will be out of school. Uh, you remember what it was like to be out of school, and it felt like summer was going to last forever. And then, just like that, you were back in school. The seasons, I mean, every three months, things are changing. We enjoy the pleasures of the seasons for a while. I mean, you, there's activities that you do in the spring. And those are fun, but it's short-lived. Summer, man, we're going to go on vacation. We're going to go do these things, but it's short-lived. During the fall, we're going to go look at fall colors, and we're going to see all these things in the fall, but it's short-lived. The magic of winter, right? But it's short-lived. They're just a season. And it's the same when it comes to alcohol, to drugs, to sexual uh, encounters. It's short-lived, the pleasure that comes from it. And the season of pleasure that this unnamed maniac had, I promise you, was short-lived. Wherever he started out at, he probably thought this is going to be fun. Makes me think of the prodigal son. You remember, he decided he was going to go for a while and live this riotous life. But it was short-lived. Where did the prodigal son end up? He ended up in a hog pen eating hog slop. That's where sin takes you. He was smart enough to know, I don't want to stay here. The attractiveness, the allure of sin, it was short-lived. And he finally had the good sense to get up and run back to the father. And where was the father at? He was standing in the road with his arms wide open, ready to take him back in. Amen. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. The book of Job says, The wicked man travaileth with pain all his days. The book of Proverbs, The way of transgressors is hard. 
That's the life of sin. That's the life that this unnamed, this new dude in Mark chapter 5, that's the life that he was living a hard life. We see the demonic presence there uh, in this cemetery as he lives alone. That's what sin will do to you. Sin leaves you alone. You may start out with friends all around, but where do you go next? Everybody walks away. In the alcohol commercials, there's always a big party and everybody's left. Where do you wake up the next morning? Same with drugs. I remember the mission trip we took to inner city Philadelphia. At night, we'd go in to stay inside the church building. You'd hear the party music outside. In the morning, you'd get up, we'd go out on the front porch, and all along the sidewalk of the church, we would help them sweep up the needles that the addicts had been using all night. It was a big party at night, but in the morning, man, there were just people laying on the side of the street. That's what sin does. They were alone. This man's alone. And we see that this man finally has a desperate plea. He knew that God was vastly different than what he was. He knew that God had something different than what he was experiencing in his life. And so when he finds out that Jesus was near, this man runs to Jesus. But when he saw Jesus afar off, verse number 6, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. We see the drawing of a loving Savior in this man's life. You would think that this demon-possessed man would run the opposite way of the Lord, but instead he runs to him and he falls down and he worships Jesus. Uh, I think it indicates that he knew who Jesus was. We never know, you know, we never know how God is working in the hearts of people. I think of my friend Jennifer that got saved a couple weeks ago and baptized last Sunday. Several times over 13 years, I took the opportunity to share the gospel with her and she'd always said no. But God never stopped working in her heart. He never let her forget those conversations. He was convicting her for 13 years. She said no until a couple months ago she finally said, I think I need Jesus in my life. Amen. Don't give up on people. Don't Quit giving up that hope that the Lord can turn their life around. God was working even in the heart of this naked, crazed maniac. God was working in his heart. How many people do you think would have given up on him? If that dude had walked into our church, would we have given up on him? Said, man, there's no hope for this guy. We can think somebody's so engrossed in a wicked lifestyle that there's just nothing that can be done about them. It's a lost cause. Don't give up on people. God can be in the background just quietly drawing them to himself. And a lot of times, you know, the more emphatic a person is about their rejection of the Lord, it may be that he's really convicting them inside. And they know that something needs to change. And the more emphatically they reject it, the more it is that, that they feel that that pull is there that they need something different in their life. And this maniac, man, it says that he could pluck the bands of man uh, asunder. They couldn't tame him. They couldn't keep him in chains. But when Jesus was there, he couldn't resist the bands of love that Jesus had to draw him into himself. Then look at verse number 7. We'll see the demands of a legion of spirits. He cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the God, most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Uh, even uh, thousands of demons. Uh, how many were there? I don't know. We know that uh, in the Roman military, a legion was 6,000. We know there were 2,000 pigs there. I don't know how many demons there were, but there were a, a couple thousand at least of these demons. And they knew that when Jesus showed up, they weren't any match for the Son of God. They recognized the power that his presence brought. Uh, that should bring peace to our hearts, knowing that when Jesus, when we're in his presence, man, 
we're in the most powerful presence that there is. Because you have, as a believer, you have Christ living in you. This morning, he sits on the throne of heaven. As a song I was listening to this morning called, I Know My Redeemer Lives. It says, he sits on the throne of heaven, but he also sits on the throne of my heart. That's where Christ is this morning. He's, he, you have him living within you. And so Satan has no power over us. You are of God, little children, First John says. Uh, and he says, you've overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Bible says that if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us. It says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. And then lastly this morning, I want you to see a divine power. This is where we see Christ's power over the demons. The same power that Jesus had to change this man's life, he offers the same power in our lives today. Uh, Jesus is greater than any challenge, uh, including uh, demonically inspired challenges, uh, that you're going to face in service to him. There's going to be some problems. If you try to serve the Lord with your life, you're going to have some problems. You're going to have some challenges. You're going to have some difficulties. But listen, this morning, Jesus is greater than that. Uh, That's the theme of the life of Jesus, that Jesus is greater than you fill in the rest. It doesn't matter what it is. Jesus is greater than that. Your sickness, your weakness. You remember Moses? He said, I can't talk. The Lord will give you the words to say. Jesus is greater than. Uh, He's greater than death. If we celebrate the the Easter season the next couple of weeks, uh, Jesus proved he's greater than death. We know that because Jesus went to the grave and came out alive, that as believers, when we go to the grave, we'll also come out alive. Jesus is greater. And we see his absolute power in verse number 13. Forthwith, Jesus gave them leave, talking about these demons. And the unclean spirits went out, and they entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They fall into the water. Satan, once again, is a defeated foe. He's a defeated enemy. Uh, Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection proves it. He's won the victory over Satan. The book of Hebrews says that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Uh, Jesus came to bring life, not to destroy lives, but to bring life. He's not the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to give life and joy, to give it abundantly. 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. We have a defeated foe this morning. He walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but he's a defeated foe. We saw that last Sunday in the morning message as we talked about the battle of Armageddon. Uh, With one word, when the Lord returns in that second coming, with one word, he will stop the armies of Satan. He'll stop the armies of this world that have gathered against him with one word. We see absolute power in his life. And then notice the astonished people. They marveled at the power of God. That's what it should do in our lives. Verse number 20, uh, uh, verse number 14. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. Now, the night before on the sea, Jesus had calmed the storm. In the book of Matthew, it says he arose, he rebuked the winds. There was a great calm, but the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and sea obey him? Uh, When Jesus steps into a situation and demonstrates his power, it causes us just to marvel at the awesome power of our God. He has power over everything. He has power over everybody. He'd shown his power the night before over nature. Now, today, in this area where this crazed naked maniacs at he shows his power over human nature Uh, there's nothing that stands before Jesus that can't obey what he says to do and then notice there in verse 14 that when the people that were watching this saw what happened they run and they start to tell everybody else what was going on you know what ought to amaze us more than the power that God has 
uh, over demons. A lot of people are uh, impressed with that. And this is impressive that Jesus had that power to do that. Uh, or more than the fact that he had the power to calm the storm on the sea. It's impressive that he did that. But at the heart of the story is the fact that God, in human form, as Jesus Christ, he loved this man, and he desired to save this man from his sin. And in your life, he had the same desire, that God loves you. And he wanted to save you from your sin. Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 10, they were wanting to know, do we have the power to cast out demons? A lot of people today uh, with some new Christian films that are out, this is a big discussion right now in Christian circles, you know, can we cast out demons out of people? What did Jesus tell his disciples? He said, "Uh, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. He says, don't get excited over the fact that you may have the ability to cast out the demon of some Uh, out of some person. He says, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Uh, Be excited about that. I think of the song. It's been a while since we've sung it here, but it was written back in the early 1900s by George Beverly Shea. The wonder of it all. It says this. It says, there's the wonder of sunset at evening. The wonder of sunrise I see. When you see the sunrise, you see the sunset. Man, there's some beautiful things. But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. Then there was a distinct peace. Jesus shows up, there's this power, and then there's peace. Uh, This transformation that happened in this man, it was immediate. It was drastic. Uh, His life had been consumed by rage, uh, by uh, demon possession. But now... His life is the picture of peace. It was a drastic change. And the frightened people, they ran into the city and the countryside to tell what had just happened. And people start to come where Jesus was to see what had happened. Verse 15, they come to Jesus and they see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Wow, what a change in this man's life. He ain't no longer the nude dude in a rude mood, is he? This man's clothed, he's sitting, he's in his right mind, he's laughing at the right times, you know, he's not some crazed individual. That's the greatest miracle is the miracle of salvation, how it changes us. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. It's a metamorphosis that happens inside of our lives as Jesus transforms us into the image of his dear son is what the book of Romans says. A dead man sinned. A dead man in sin has become alive in Christ. And then we see a demented condemnation. Uh, The people in this town, they weren't super happy about all the things that had happened in this man's life. Can you believe that? This group of people, they'd put up with a man that was living in the cemetery, screaming with these wild, blood-curdling screams as a demon-possessed maniac cutting himself with stones, breaking off chains, running around naked. They lived with this man so long that they kind of got comfortable with him. It says when he was sitting, clothed, and in his right mind, it says they were afraid. Uh, Lost people, they get so used to seeing sin all around them uh, that nothing really shocks them. But you ever notice that when somebody's life gets radically changed by Jesus, they're like, what happened to you? Did you join a cult or something? Like, what's wrong with you now? Like, the sin doesn't bother them anymore. It's when Jesus shows up that it really starts to bother them that their lives have been changed. If you're like the world, the world will like you. But the moment that your life is changed by the power of Jesus Christ, uh, you may find that some of those friends that were comfortable around you, they're no longer comfortable. They'll be afraid. They want to get away. They don't want something to do with some religious fanatic. Uh, I mean, he doesn't drink with us anymore. He doesn't talk like us anymore. He doesn't go with the same places we go anymore. And Jesus said that would be the case. And all of a sudden, this man, he has a desire for companionship with the Lord Jesus Christ that he never had before. When he was come to the ship, verse 18, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might stay with him. 
Uh, this is evidence of this man's salvation. His life's been changed, and who does he want to be with? He wants to be with Jesus. That's a mark of a, of a believer when you want to spend time with Jesus. People who don't want to have anything to do with the Lord, with his church, with, with other believers, sometimes you wonder about them. Has their life been changed? They, they feel more comfortable around the sinners than they do the saved. We've got to be careful in our lives that we don't get comfortable with those people. It should be our brothers and sisters in Christ that we want to spend time with. Desire to spend time with the Lord in prayer, Bible reading. And he wants to spend his life following Jesus. Why? Because Jesus had done something in his life he couldn't do for himself. Paul says, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Uh, we should want to live for Jesus. Because he loved us so much that he went to the cross that he's transformed our lives, he's changed us from the inside out. And then we see this command that he's given at the end, this doable command. He'd only been saved a few minutes, and he wanted to be with Jesus. But what does Jesus tell him to do? He says, verse 19, Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go. Sounds kind of like the Great Commission, doesn't it? That's what, how it starts. Go. He says, Go home to thy friends. And tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. Uh, had this man been to Bible college? Did this man have a degree? Was this man a pastor? Uh, was this man an evangelist? And Jesus told him to go do what though? Uh, tell how great things God's done in your life. Uh, this man didn't have any formal education or training. Jesus said, hey, you know what you need to do, sir? You need to go tell people what I've done in your life. That's called sharing your testimony. You can tell people, uh, here's what I was before I got saved. But let me tell you, when I met Jesus, here's how Jesus changed my life. That's what sharing the gospel is. That's what the Great Commission's about. You don't have to have a degree, a calling, anything like that. If you've been saved, you have a testimony. Go share it with your friends, with your family, with those that you meet. Tell others of what Jesus has done in your life. The man who had been delivered from demons, he did exactly what Jesus said. He went and told others. Verse number 20, he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. This was a dynamic catalyst in this man's life when Jesus showed up. Jesus only came to this region here at Decapolis on two different occasions. The first time's right here in Mark chapter 5 when he showed up and he met this demon-possessed man. And he told him, go tell everybody else what I've done for you. Jesus shows up again in Mark chapter 7, and it records that this man had been a witness in the area. When Jesus showed up the next time, the people that had saw this man's changed life, they wanted to know more about Jesus. And, and many people began to come to Jesus because of what this crazed maniac, how his life had been radically transformed. What was it that made the difference? Well, the difference was an unnamed man. That's how people in this area started coming to know Jesus. One wild, naked, crazed, rude, nude dude met Jesus, and his life changed, and he started telling other people, and man, look at how many people came to Jesus. They began to bring needy people to Jesus, sick folks to Jesus. The difference was he had been changed by the power of Christ. See, you can make a difference in people's lives. Because if you're a believer this morning, you've been changed by the power of Christ in your life. What is there to do? Go and share it with people. We're coming into April, which is our missions emphasis month. You see, the devil has all kinds of advertisements like alcohol. Talks about being the most interesting man in the world. Fairy tales come true, all of this kind of stuff. He's got all kinds of advertisements. Uh, the Lord has advertisements too. The Bible tells us that we are his epistles. We are the, the book. We are the letter that people will read. Your testimony your life, you are a walking billboard for Jesus. People are going to read what's in your life. You can bring people to Jesus by demonstrating with your life how he has changed you, how he has transformed you. You are epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, 
not in tables of stone, not in fleshly, but in fleshly tables of the heart. God has written a story with your life. It's an ad for him. Are we living that out? Are we drawing people to Jesus? I hope that we are. Let's pray. God, thank you for this opportunity this morning to study about your radical, life-changing power, Lord, that no situation is too hopeless for you to step in and take control of. Lord, we pray that this week we would look for opportunities to go and tell our friends and family about the great things you've done in our life, how you've transformed us, how you've changed us, what the power of Christ can do for anyone who's willing to listen. We pray that you'd have your will and way in this morning's service. Help us to sing out of hearts of love and gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen.